an amazing lineup of speakers. And we're really excited to invite a bunch of girl geeks over to hear these lightning talks on AI. It's really an honor to be here tonight. Thank you all for being here. It's been a wild few years. We're very excited to deepen our partnership together. Today we're going to be talking about uh, language models. This talk is called, If at First You Don't Succeed, Try, Try Again. I went to talk uh, this evening about my own path through OpenAI, but especially about the two music models that I worked on. Our core mission is to make sure that artificial intelligence benefits all of humanity instead of just a small number of rich people in Silicon Valley. The goal of it is really to de help develop AI talent. We're doing all sorts of projects in the sort of image, audio, and video domains. They were super helpful uh, in making my experience here amazing. And to be a humanitarian organization with a humanitarian mission, we need a wide diversity of perspectives here. Mm -hmm try to change the world together. I am happy to report that I think we actually did. Hello, thank you everyone for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Angie Chang and I'm one of the founders of Girl Geek X. We started uh, over a decade ago as Bay Area Girl Geek Dinners and we're still going strong. Uh, thank you to OpenAI for hosting us for a second time. We're really excited to see the new office and invite a bunch of Girl Geeks over to hear these lightning talks on AI and policy and all these things that we're so excited to learn about tonight. Hi, I, I know y'all were still chatting when Angie introduced herself, but she's Angie and Girl Geek, dot, Girl Geek X is basically um, this, her brainchild. It started off with Angie, you know, looking to bring women together. I'm doing your pitch, Angie, for you because I have a lot of voice. Some people say that, you know, they ask me if I swallowed a mic as a child because I'm so long and I don't, so loud and I don't need a mic. Um, but anyway, I'm Sukruta. So Angie started Girl Geek and it was back then called Bay Area Girl Geek Dinners. This was over 10 years ago. And when I had just moved to the Bay Area looking for ways to meet new people and I found out about uh, BayAreaGirlGeekDinners.com at that time. And I tried really hard to meet with Angie, but she was a busy bee doing all sorts of cool things, trying to change the world. And this was way before ERGs existed, right? So people didn't have a way to connect with the community until they went to meetups. And Girl Geek Dinners at that time was the one way you could also get an insight into what these sponsoring companies worked on, what it was life was like. And so it also allowed people to get um, an opportunity to speak. And these were a lot of the speakers at Girl Geek Dinners were, were first-time speakers. They were too afraid to sign up for conferences. So you know, if you go to our website, girlgeek.io, you'll see all these amazing stats on how <laughs> Since Angie started, there's been a real shift in the environment and how people are more willing to speak at conferences due to some of the uh, chances they've gotten um, as a result of speaking at you know, an event sponsored by their company. So this organization exists. I joined Angie, and we tried to change the world together. I'm happy to report that I think we actually did. Um, we rebranded uh, to Girl Geek X, and uh, that's when the organization hit 10 years. It was a sizable number of people working on it, which was Angie and me. <laughs> and it was just the two of us. And then Angie had this idea to like really evolve it into a company. And so that's when you know she started to bring on contractors, more people, like such as somebody who could take video of our events to make us look a little bit more professional, and somebody else to do our website besides me. And um, we started to do podcasts. We started to do virtual annual conferences. And, and you know, we really, really, really were always consistently sold out for our in-person events that would happen at various companies that we partnered with through the Bay Area. Then COVID hit, and the good thing is that we still had, we had already started to have a global presence through the uh, virtual conferences that we had, and we've now had four? Five. Five. Yeah. We're also now, we used to be carpooling all around the Bay Area together to these events after work, and now we're moms. So <laughs> 
It's amazing. We would look up and see uh, amazing people working at these sponsoring companies speak, and we'd be like, wow, look at them managing their mom life and coming to, you know, <laughs> parent life and coming to these events. But, you know, I just think that it's now become such a common thing that it's not as isolated anymore. And I'm hopeful that, you know, you all can come back um, again and again because this in-person event has really made me really happy. I've been holed up in, the, in my home office today, which is basically a room which also has my, my uh, what's it called? A bike that stays in one place, stationary bike. <laughs> so it has like too many things going on in the room. But I wanted to give a big thanks to OpenAI for hosting us for the second time, uh, for sponsoring for the second time. And I hope that we can keep doing this. So please do get your companies to sponsor and encourage them to do it in person. Uh, that's all I will say. I know I said a lot more than I planned, but thank you again, and Angie. Thank you, Sugrutha, for the intro. Um, I guess I should talk up Sugrutha a little more. Um, when I first met her, she was a software engineer in test, and now she was at Salesforce as a senior director of engineering there. So I'm very proud of her. Um, and over the years, we, like she mentioned, we have a podcast, we have annual virtual conferences, we'll be launching a career fair virtually as well to be, to be announced. And um, yeah, I don't want to say too much. We have a line, an amazing lineup of speakers tonight, and we're going to invite up first Elena, who is our host for the night from OpenAI. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Elena. I work here, and I'm on the recruiting team. Uh, I'm leading the residency program right now. Um, I'm very excited that you're all here um, and have joined us together. Um, really want to thank Angie and Girl Geek X. We're, we're very excited to deepen our partnership together and to be back in the office here all together in the new space uh, and to experience this tonight. Um, we're, we're very excited um, about um, having you here and uh, in terms of what, what we'll see tonight, we'll have a series of lightning talks and then that will be followed by Q&A and then we'll get some dessert in the area that we were before um, and then we'll wrap up at 8.30. But uh, before we get started, I did want to take a moment to make a quick plug and share that we're actively hiring for our residency program and that includes both research and engineering roles. Um, and the goal of it is really to de help develop AI talent. Um, the program, it offers a pathway to a full-time role at OpenAI um, for folks that are currently not focusing on AI and are already researchers or engineers in a different field. So we're really excited to hear from you. So if you do have um, an interest in like making this career switch, come talk to me after and we'll also have full-time um, uh, recruiting team members um, and positions that we're hiring for in, across research pro product and engineering that um, we can tell you more about. So please uh, come find us um, and uh, learn more about the interview process, but also what the program offers. Um, so with that, I wanted to introduce our first speaker, uh, Christine. Um, who's currently managing our multimodal team and uh, previously worked on music generation research, created MuseNet, and uh, was collab collaborating on ju Jukebox. And uh, before that was a classical pianist um, who transitioned into a researcher as well. So um, I'll hand it over to Christine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um. So yes, it's, it's really an honor to be here tonight. Thank you all for being here. Um, and this residency program is near and dear to my own heart because uh, I first joined OpenAI through uh, what was in the scholars program and the fellows program. And those are the programs which have since evolved into this, this residency program. So I'll put a plug in for anyone who's considering it. But I want to talk uh, this evening about my own path through OpenAI, but especially about the two music models that I worked on during the time here. Um, I thought I'd start by just going ahead and playing an example of each of the models. So the first one, this is the one I worked on when I was doing the, the Scholars and Fellows program. This is MuseNet, uh, which works in the MIDI domain. So this is the model trying to generate in the style of jazz. OK, I'll cut that off. Um, and then. Uh, after I joined full-time, uh, I was lucky enough to collaborate with some amazing researchers here um, to work on a model that was instead working in the raw audio domain. 
And the fun of that is you get to imitate human voices. So this is trying to do the style of Elvis um, with lyrics by Hiwoo. Just a tiny almost scarf, but the little hitch tells the heart. When my toes slip, when my hair is slipped by. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, as Lana mentioned, uh, before being at OpenAI, I was actually working as a pianist. Um, I, I had done some math and physics in college, but obviously it had been a long time. Um, and so, I think I took a good year of self-studying before I was I, before I applied to anything. Um, and I thought I would just give a shout out to three of the online programs that I particularly liked um, at that point. Um, they're all amazing. Uh, but then I was lucky enough to join the first cohort of scholars that we had here. Um, and at that point, I was just trying to do this process of kind of learning about all these different models. Um, like, and, and I had this feeling that, okay, instead of just copying a model or copying what someone else has done, let me just try to translate it into a field that I know well, which was music. Uh, and so uh, what became MuseNet was really my attempt to, to sort of take all of the stuff I was learning and then apply it to the music domain instead. So... Uh, MIDI format is this really like nice representation of music. It's I, I think of it as like it's kind of the way that a composer thinks of music. So it it'll do things like it tells you what note it plays when, the timing of it, the volume of it, things like that, which instrument is supposed to play. But it loses all the like the actual detail of when a human takes it and performs it. So you don't get a person's voice, you don't get like the sound of a great cellist, anything like that. So, but the nice thing is it's what you sort of trade in expressivity, you get in this like nice, really meaningful representation. <laughs> it's about, like, it does sound pretty terrible when you try to render it to, <laughs> to real sound. But as a musician, just thinking about the structure of music, uh, this was a nice simplification for a scholar's project. So um, what I did is I, I took a bunch of MIDI files, uh, and I tried to pull them out and turn them into a sort of language to make them look as much like the sort of thing that you could get a neural net to predict as possible. So I did things like uh, I would always tell the model which composer or which band was going to be first, and then things like what tempo was going to be, when notes would turn on and off, um, and sort of a, a wait token, which would tell the model how long to wait, things like that. Um, and then what you end up doing is you, you translate that tokenization into a, just like a, a dictionary of numbers. Um, and the model sees something like this, which I think that this is the first page of a Chopin ballade or something. So what the model is faced with is this task of, given the very first number, what number do you think is going to come next? And then given the first two numbers, what number is going to come next? And when you first look at the first thing, like, and when the model first sees it, it's like, how do you do this? Like, what does that even mean, right? It feels like an impossible task. Um, but what happens is the model sees many, many, many examples of this. And over time, it starts to pick up on, like, ah, if I see, like, 4,006, somehow I tend to see 586 more often after that or something. It, it starts to pick up on these patterns, which we know because we know the tokenization was like, oh, if a piano plays the note G, then probably soon after it's going to turn off the note G or something. It, it has real musical meaning to us. But the model is just seeing these numbers like that. But the nice thing is the model gets really good at this job, um, and then you can turn it into a generator just by sampling based on, like, ah, it thinks there's like a 20% chance this token is going to come next. So 20% of the time, take that. Um, and the other really fun thing you can do is you can then study the sort of mathematical representation you've gotten for these tokens. So I, I was always giving it the composer or the band token in the beginning, and now you can look at the vectors or the sort of embedding that it learns for these composers. And as a musician, it's really fun because like, I would clearly think that, that Debussy and Ravel and Fort, like all these French guys are related, and the model just picked up on the same thing, which is cool. Um, but the other really fun thing is that you can mix and match those embeddings. So here is uh, the start of one of my very favorite Chopin nocturnes. So I actually just gave the model like the first six notes of that. <laughs> and this is what the model thought if instead it was being written by uh, <laughs> Chopin, it was, it was a Bon Jovi piece. So. It's 
so it goes on for a while, but I'll cut it off there. Um, and, and that was um, Usenet. Um, and then I, I ended up joining full time after that. Uh, and I was lucky enough to collaborate with uh, Profla and Hiwu on uh, taking music generation over to the raw audio domain. And so in a way, this is, this is a much harder problem uh, because uh, now, whereas in MIDI world, you have just like nice tokens, which are meaningful in a musical way, uh, raw audio is just like literally 22,000 or 44,000 times per second. You're recording how loud the sound is at that moment in time. Um, and the nice thing about it is it's, it gives you all this expressive freedom, right? Like literally any sound you can imagine, you can represent as a sound wave. It's, it's just audio recordings of that. <laughs> the trouble is there are just so many ways for those waves to go wrong or those patterns to go wrong. Like if you mess up on the short scale, it's just like crazy hissing noise. If you mess up on long scale, like your piece sadly starts getting out of tune or the rhythm drifts or like so many ways it can go wrong. It's, it's really an unforgiving um, sort of medium. And the problem is now, in order to get like a minute of music, it's no longer maybe 3,000 tokens you have to do. It's, it's maybe a million numbers that you have to get correct. Uh, so we approached this by looking at ways that we could compress the music um, to make it more tractable. Because uh, like at that point, uh, a transformer could maybe deal well with the context of 4,000 tokens or something. So, so we used an autoencoder to do three different layers or levels of compression. Uh, and the, the sort of least compressed on the bottom, the nice thing about that is it's very easy to translate it back to the regular raw audio. So if you put like some original song in and then back out, you don't notice any loss at all. Whereas if you put it through the most compressed version, the nice thing is now it's super compressed, like 3,000 tokens might get you a half a minute of music or something. But if you go through this simple, just like trying to reconstruct the raw audio, it sounds really bad. You can sort of tell that someone's singing, but you've lost most of the detail. But the nice thing about it is when you work in that top layer of tokens, now this looks a lot like the MuseNet problem or even just a lot like language problem where you're just predicting tokens. Um, so we trained a transformer on that. We even did, we, we sort of added in the same, like which person was singing, which band was playing. Uh, and then we also added in where you can write the lyrics in. So, uh, so the model conditions on the lyrics and then generates these tokens. Uh, and then I won't get into the details, but we had to train extra transformers to do this upsampling process so that you could get back to raw audio without totally losing uh, all the detail. And the fun thing is you can do things like uh, ask it to generate in the style of Sinatra uh, singing Hot Tub Christmas. And I have to put in a plug, these were lyrics uh, by, at that point, GPT-2. <laughs> It's Christmas time and you know what that means. Oh, the touch of time as I like the tree this year will be a song. All right. <laughs> it's a Christmas classic now. <laughs> Um, and then last, I wanted to wrap up by talking a little bit about the multimodal team, which is uh, the team that I'm really excited to be managing these days. Um, it's this really, really great group of people. Um, unfortunately, our current projects are all internal, and I can't talk about them, although stay tuned. Uh, we'll, we'll be publishing them to the blog when we can. Um, uh, you, you might recognize Clip, uh, which was work done by Alec and Zhang Wook, both on our team. Uh, this is... I guess nearly two years ago already, but made a really big impact on the image uh, work at that point. And then just to put in a plug for the team, uh, we're about a group of 10 at this point, uh, and we will be hosting a resident in 2023. So, so please reach out if anyone's interested to talk more. Uh, and then uh, we're doing all sorts of projects in the sort of image, audio, and video domains. Um, both on the sort of understanding side and generation side. And we end up working really closely with Algorithms, which is the other team that tends to do uh, a lot of awesome multimodal projects. Um, but then also, anytime we get close to things that we're looking at uh, uh, putting out to customers, we end up working with Applied through that. And then also, obviously, scaling, because uh, at OpenAI, we believe deeply in this, uh, like, get a good pattern and then scale it up, and it becomes awesome. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Christine. That was awesome. 
Um, so now next we'll have Alethea. Um, Alethea has spent the last couple of years at OpenAI working on getting neural networks to do math. Before that, they built large infrastructure health system, studied math and philosophy, and spent lots of time singing karaoke. <laughs> Welcome, Alethea. So this talk is called, If at First You Don't Succeed, Try, Try Again. It's been a wild few years. I decided I wanted to give an uplifting and encouraging talk. It's a short talk, so it doesn't get too deep into technical details. But if you're interested in it, please find me afterwards. I will talk your ear off about it. OK, uh, my name is Alethea Power. And yes, Patience is actually my middle name, which will be very relevant for this talk. OK. So about 10 years ago, I was a software engineer and site reliability engineer. And my dream was to get into artificial intelligence. But I didn't know how to do it. I didn't have a degree in AI. I didn't have any background in AI. I didn't have any idea how to break in. So I thought, ah, I probably need to take some time off to study this before I can get into the field. So I started saving up some money so that I could take time off to study. But by the time I had enough money saved up, I realized I needed to handle my gender issues. So I took that time off to go through a gender transition instead of studying AI. Eventually, though, I was finally ready to, to try and, and break into AI in some form or fashion. And that was about the time that OpenAI hosted their last Girl Geek dinner. That was in 2019. And I came to that talk, and I met one of the recruiters who stunned me by telling me I didn't need to have a degree in AI, and I didn't need to have a background in AI to be able to work here. She introduced me to the Scholars Program, the same program that uh, Christine went through, um, which today is called the Residency Program. And I applied to that, and I got in, and I had the best mentor in the entire program, Christine. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm second generation scholar up here. Um, but there were, uh, you know, in addition to the obstacles before, there were obstacles after joining the program as well. About three weeks after I joined, there was a pandemic. You may have heard about it. Um, yeah, but despite spending a lot of time fearing that I might die or people I love might die for some reason or another, health or political, um, Christine was very uh, kind and understanding and supportive. And she helped me get to the point where I had learned a ton about artificial intelligence and managed to do a great project. And I ended up applying full time. And I got three offers here. Thank you. I, I, I wasn't trying to brag, but thank you. <laughs> this is more to encourage you. <laughs> um, so I ended up taking a job on a team that was trying to teach neural networks to reason and do math. And what I want to talk about here is about a year after I joined that team, I released my first research paper called Grokking, Generalization Beyond Overfitting on Small Data Sets. So I'm going to give you a very basic introduction to what all that jargon means. Um, and like I said, if you want more technical details, come talk to me afterwards. So first, I need to explain how training neural networks works. If you have a background in ML, this is going to be very basic 101. If you don't, it's going to be exciting. <laughs> OK, so usually when we're trying to train a neural network, we've, we've got some amount of data that captures a pattern that we want that neural network to recreate in the future. And often, if we're doing what's called supervised training, we'll break that data up into training data and evaluation data. And you can think of this, the training data, as sort of what we actually teach the neural network, what it learns from. So this is like classroom education. And evaluation data is basically like pop quizzes to see how much the neural network learned. And neural networks have this nice property where you can pop quiz them. They don't learn anything from the pop quiz. They just tell you how they did. And then five minutes later, you can pop quiz them again. And the questions are all new again. They have no memory of them. So. Throughout the course of training, we measure the performance of the neural network on both the training data, the classroom instruction, and the evaluation data, the pop quizzes. And there's two main ways we measure this. One is called loss. 
Um, I won't go into details right now about what loss is, but the short version is um, it's a differentiable function, calculus derivatives, that we use to actually figure out how to modify the network so it learns. When loss goes down, the network is learning. Um, accuracy is exactly what you would think of being like a test score. So 0% accuracy means you got every question wrong. 100% accuracy means you got every question right. So this is what a very successful uh, neural network training looks like. So you can see, oh, the x-axis here on both of these graphs is steps of training. So you can see that as we train this neural network along, the loss on both the training and evaluation go down. So it's learning what it's supposed to learn from, and it's able to generalize that to, um, to the pop quizzes. So it's doing well on the tests as well. And then this is what it's actually scoring. So by the end of this training, it gets up to like 90% accuracy. So it, it's got an A. Sometimes, though, if you train a neural network for too long, it starts to do what's called overfitting. You might remember the word overfitting from the title of the paper. In this case, the neural network learns too much detail from the training set that doesn't really generalize to the rest of the world. And so its performance on the quizzes starts to get worse. So an example of this, in, in this paper, I was training neural networks to do math, um, basic mathematical equations. So for instance, if it happened to be the case that the training data had more even numbers than odd numbers, and if it was trying to learn addition, then it might learn that usually the answer is gonna be even. Well, in reality, that's not true in addition. In reality, you wanna actually know how to add, and the number's gonna be whatever it is. So that would be an example where it learned some sort of incorrect, non-generalizable information from the training set, and that made it start performing worse on the evaluation set. And you can see here in this situation, the accuracy on evaluation would go back down. Sometimes, and this is very common when you're trying to get a neural network to do math, you have an even worse situation where the same thing happens with your loss, but it consistently fails the pop quiz every time gets to 100% accuracy on the training data and fails the pop quiz. This means the network, and we were using similar kinds of networks to the ones Christine was talking about, just math instead of music. This means the network never really understood what it was, what it was learning. It just memorized it. So this is like the kid who knows that when you say six plus four, you're supposed to respond with 10, but has no idea how to actually add. So, this was a common scenario uh, when training neural networks to do math. They're really good at pattern recognition, but they're not always good at understanding, um, understanding like a deep, analytical, precise truth underneath the pattern. Well, then one day we got lucky. And by lucky, I mean forgetful. So one of my coworkers was running an experiment like this, and he went on vacation and forgot to stop it. And so a week later, he came back, and it had just kept studying and 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 studying, and, studying. and it learned. So what happened here was it went into this overfitting regime where usually we'd say, ah, it's learned all it can learn from this training data. There's no more to learn. And see, it still had zero accuracy. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And then suddenly, long after it memorized all of the training data, it had an aha moment. And it was like, oh, all this stuff that I memorized actually makes a pattern. And the pattern is addition or division or S5 composition or what, you know, whichever task we had it working on. And then the loss started coming back down on the pop quizzes. And it went up and it got 100%. This is weird. This never happens in neural networks. So uh, we dug in and recreated this many times, implemented it twice, saw the same behavior with two completely independent implementations on a wide variety of tasks. And there's all sorts of other interesting stuff about when this happens and when it doesn't. Ask me in the questions afterwards. But the point here is at first the network didn't succeed but it just kept trying <laughs> the same way I did when at first I couldn't get into AI, but I just kept trying. 
We named this phenomenon, where it finally figures it out, uh, grokking. And we named this after Robert Heinlein's novel, Stranger in a Strange Land. Uh, it's a science fiction book, and grok is a Martian word in that book, which means to understand so thoroughly that the observer becomes a part of the observed, to merge, blend, intermarry, lose identity in group experience. And it turns out this is exactly what these neural networks do. I'm going to let you take pictures before I change the slide. <laughs> so this network was trying to learn modular addition. And modular addition, you can think of as like adding hours on a clock. Also, thank you to Christine for that analogy. So if you have 11 and you add 3 to it, you don't end up with 14. You end up with 2, because that's what happens on the clock. So the clock is modulo 12. We were having it learn modulo 97. And then we tore open the network that had grokked afterwards to see what was going on inside of it. And it had actually built internally this circular structure of the numbers. It had created the mathematical structure we were trying to get it to learn that, under, that allowed it to actually solve the problem. Did this with all different kinds of problems. So um, we had one network learning to compose permutations. And it found what are called uh, subgroups and cosets out of that. Details later. Um, but the point is, it worked so hard for so long through so much failure that it became the knowledge it was trying to, it was trying to, uh, to get. So the point here is that if your dream is to get into AI, even if you have no background in AI, or whatever your dream is, it doesn't matter, keep trying and keep trying and keep trying and keep trying, and maybe you can get there eventually. And in particular, if your dream is to work at OpenAI, which I highly recommend, because this place is fabulous, then try. Even if it's not the background you have already, even if you feel like you have a weird background, or you're not like the people here, or like the people in this field, we're a humanitarian organization. Our core mission, embodied in our legal structure and our financial structure, is to make sure that artificial intelligence benefits all of humanity instead of just a small number of rich people in Silicon Valley. And to be a humanitarian organization with a humanitarian mission, we need a wide diversity of perspectives here. If you have a different life story, a different path, different perspectives than we've seen before, that makes you more valuable here, not less. So please consider applying. Thank you so much, Alethea. Um, that was awesome. And now next, we'll have Taina, who's on the policy research team, currently doing a rotation on applied research. And she participated in the Open AI Scholars Program, has spent some time researching economic impacts of our models, building safety evaluations, and collaborated on WebGPT and Moderation API. Let's hear from Taina. Uh, so many of you. Um, let's see. Okay, this works. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I'm uh, Taina Lindu. I'll be speaking to you today about making language models useful. Uh, a bit about myself. Wow. I'm also a former scholar. Um, I can't make the claim to third generation. Uh, because Alethea was not my mentor, but uh, they were super helpful uh, in making my experience here amazing. And uh, part of that culture and that welcoming uh, environment was a reason I chose to stay on after the scholars program. So um, today we're going to be talking about uh, language models, right? Uh, and by language model, I mean any model that has uh, language as input and output. So that could mean GPT-3, Codex, or Big Sciences Bloom, what have you. OK, this is going to be the only equation you see uh, <laughs> throughout this talk, and it's really not that important. Um, but I think it gives us some context as to where we're going. So looking back at this, um, this is the training objective for GPT-3 and for all GPT-like models. So given a corpus of tokens, right? we define the objective to maximize this likelihood L, 
which is defined as a conditional log probability over a sequence of tokens that is mod modeled by a neural network uh, with parameters theta that is trained by gradient descent. Now you can forget everything I just said. So uh, essentially, this optimization produces these models that are trained to predict tokens. But that in itself may not be that useful on its own. So I don't think I'm giving away any secret sauce by revealing this equation to you. Um, but it is remarkable that somehow we go from this to models that can produce, oh, sorry, that can do that, right? Write prose, write code, or parse data, and so on. So I'd like to talk a bit about the notion of usefulness itself. So one way to think about whether language models are useful in the first place is in the pragmatic sense. So in the ideal scenario, we would be able to succinctly communicate our goals um, and preferences to a language agent without having to laboriously explain and list what to do and what not to do. How did we initially get um, usefulness out of language models? When these models were first being developed in uh, research labs, some researchers came with some ideas about how to like, really get them to do what it is that you want them to do. And these are two of the most prominent ones. One was few shot prompting, which is a method by which you really tell the model what the task is. And before putting it on the spot, so to speak, you give it some examples of what you'd like to, to do, some demonstrations, right? So uh, for translate, English to French, you could go, you could have a pen to un stylo, um, I'm hungry to j'ai faim, etc. And the translation that you actually want, you say, I would like to eat ice cream, and hopefully with that same formatting, you get the model to translate to French. Uh, the other method is supervised fine tuning, which involves essentially just having examples for the model and then kicking off another round of training. Um, so the model can become hyper-focused on your task and, and hopefully improve its performance on that task. So as many of you probably know, um, OpenAI has since then adapted this iterative deployment uh, approach, which helps us put models in the hands of real people and understand how they interact with them. So at the time of GPT-3 release, it was doing great by, by research standards, right? And Unfortunately, a lot of these uh, research metrics are designed around these methods that we spoke about before, which are you know, to uh, prompt with few shot prompting or perhaps to, to do supervi uh, supervised fine tuning. Once we deployed, we really quickly learned that people don't like <laughs> prompt engineering. In fact, they don't really like to do a lot to communicate their goals to, to the model, which is fine. It's a feature, not a bug. <laughs> so at its most helpful, uh, a language agent can infer what we want without lots of specification and carry out those inferred goals effectively and efficiently. Uh, unlike researchers, people were using natural language instructions to ask GPT-3 uh, for what they wanted. But because of the training objective that we saw previously, the model was really tempted to just pattern match, right? So if you gave it a prompt of write a short poem about a wise frog, it would very helpfully give you similar types of prompts instead of following your intent. So this spurred a research effort within our alignment team to teach the models how to follow uh, direct instructions. So they did this using two insights. Um, the first is borrowing from the supervised uh, fine tuning or supervised learning literature, where you can train the model based on examples or demonstrations, right? You have a prompt and you tell them what you would ideally like um, it to do. And the second insight came from the reinforcement learning literature, where you have some humans compare outputs. And so this model learns to generate, that model learns to compare, right? That model learns to tell, this is good, this is bad. And so now with these two things, you can kick off this joint training process where you have a model that's generating and then a model that's critiquing. Like, this is good, this is not so good. And so over the course of training, the model learns to um, get better at pursuing this objective, which is no longer the pure language model ling objective, and now it's the instruction following objective. So the resulting model was InstructGPT, which is presented here. 
Um, well, yeah, you can see the output. It's a poem, it's about a frog, it mentions wisdom, and it's pretty short. I feel like uh, all the requirements are met uh, for following instructions there. This uh, was a plot that was quite striking to me. This is uh, one of the main results from the Instruct GPT paper. Uh, when I first saw this, I, like, it didn't make a ton of sense until I really understood the research behind it. But I think that you can think of the y-axis as a proxy for usefulness, um, and the x-axis we have model size. And conventional wisdom has it that, you know, like, you know, we're at OpenAI. Uh, as you scale things, things get, in general, better. But you can see that even at its smaller size, like right here, if you can't see it, it's 1.5 billion parameters. Even at its smallest size, InstructGPT was deemed to be more useful than any permutation of the base GPT model. So I started this discussion um, by talking about how research-based approaches were not pushing far enough um, in terms of getting us usefulness out of these models. Um, there's now this um, emerging literature focused on helping models be more effective in tasks. Uh, so broadly speaking, this literature involves having models break big problems up into smaller problems or think step by step uh, before coming up with a final answer. And this does not need to be at odds with our uh, human alignment driven research. In fact, right here you see a result uh, by Kojima and et al. And although their results are great overall across the board, we do see that they make the instruct models even greater. They're, like, there's such a huge gap, um, a huge gain that we see with the uh, instruct series of models. So I would like to conclude by thinking about the next steps in this line of research. So we know that there can be some instructions that can be malicious or exploitative or deceptive. Um, if language models were to pursue usefulness at all costs, they might become dangerous in the pursuit of dangerous instructions or dangerous intents. Could there be other objectives we pursue along with usefulness that get us helpful but not dangerous models, perhaps kindness or hopefulness? And lastly, with instructions, we're mainly in the driver's seat, and we initiate interactions. As language models become smarter, perhaps kinder, more capable, it may be appropriate to think of them as collaborators. And they may be capable of initiating ideation, creation, among other things. Uh, what are the different modes of interaction we would like to have with these models? Uh, would we want them to, to advise us? Would we want them to inspire us? Um, perhaps at Girl Geek X 2042, it'll be a language model presenting <laughs> about something new. Thank you. Thank you so much all for, for joining. I guess with that note, I did want to mention that we'll kick off um, mingling time and dessert in the area that we were before, and our speakers will be available for you to ask them questions. Uh, we also have some of our recruiting team members here tonight. Um, if you all want to come up to the front, to just quickly introduce yourself, um, or just say hi so that people can see you, and then you can all come find us. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm Elena. I'm also uh, hiring for the residency program, so come talk to me, come find me. And then we also have um, uh, some demo stands um, of, of our Dolly product and also our GPT-3 if you want to check them out. Jessica and Natalie will be doing those demos, um, so um, yeah, go, go find them as well. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you to our lovely speakers and to Girl Geek X to Corey and to all of our ops team and everyone who helped put this together. And um, let's go enjoy some dessert. Mm -hmm.